Praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everybody that's here in the name of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Peace to everybody that's tuning in on the internet and also on the phone line. Glad to be here, especially glad to be back out in California. <laughs> Some of y'all we watching on Friday night. I know I was in Gary, Indiana. That's that modern technology, boy. Be all over the place. So last night we had a lesson starting off the Sabbath, plus it's also the feast. It's still the feast, so hopefully y'all got some food today. (laughs) And we can eat inside. (laughs) But last night I was in Gary, Indiana, and taught a lesson dealing with save, because a lot of people erroneously believe that they save now and don't have anything to worry about, and that's just not in the Bible. The Bible lets you know that you have to endure to the end to be saved. It's a process. Or else you wouldn't have scriptures. Like, they like to quote Paul and misquote Paul. And some of Paul's writing is hard, like Peter said in 2 Peter 3. But some of it is real clear. They never go to those places. Philippians 2 and 12 is real clear concerning salvation. Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So that means it's a process. It has to be worked out. That's the mistake a lot of people have made in church. But it's the same old thing. Satan puts you at ease like he did uh, Adam and Eve in the garden to think that you can don't have to worry about obeying God. You can get away with obeying God. It's going to be all right. Matter of fact, it's going to benefit you. That's what that's what Satan. That's the last Satan tell. Almost like the more you sin, the more grace you're going to get. Just keep on sinning. You ain't got to keep the law. But no. Being saved is a process. So that was the title. How saved are you? The righteous scarcely saved. That's what the Bible is saying, Peter. The righteous scarcely saved. So, so much for just automatically presto being saved when he got a verse like that to tell you in 1 Peter 4. If the righteous scarcely be saved. That means if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're barely making it. That's why you can't get to thinking that you exceptional or doing something so great. Because if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're doing just that, what you're supposed to do. Somebody else not doing what they're supposed to do, but you just doing what you just doing your duty. So that was last night. We got a whole nother lesson today. I did, dealt with this last week. So it might be a repeat for some of y'all that watched last Sabbath, but it's different in person. <laughs> That's all I say. But it's, it's going to show us, like I just was talking about, that we got a duty to do. We got a duty to do. And the duty that we got, uh, Ecclesiastes tell you, the whole duty of man, which includes woman, is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's our duty. But now we doing our duty so we can fulfill the purpose that God created us for. We got a purpose for us being created. And most people don't have a clue about that. Even people that go to church, they think, oh, I'm wait- I can't wait till I get to heaven. I'm going to get to heaven and fly around with my wings. And look, that's not God didn't create you for that purpose. But he did create us for a great grand purpose. And that is to be just like him. Really, in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, this whole thing, that's what it's about. It's about God creating God. And that sounds blasphemies to some people. They, what do you mean? I'm going to be, I can't be God. You try, like, you look, you're not taking away nothing from God. He can do that. He planned to make some more just like him. And Jesus is the prime example, even though Jesus was already God. Some people might not understand that, but I understand it perfectly. He was God before he became man, but he gave it up to become a man. And then After he died for our sins, he went back to his position. But therefore, he's the first man to live, die, and become God, even though he was becoming God all over again, but he still did it from scratch. See, and that's the whole purpose. You know, sometimes, you know, especially if you don't don't have no clue about God, you're in the world sometimes. I know some of y'all did it. You might not want to admit. I know you went to the mirror one time, looked in the mirror and said, what am I here for? What's my purpose? Well, this is your purpose right here. To become God. That's what God created man for. 
And it's a shame he got all these scriptures in the Bible telling you that, and most people don't have a clue that that's what it's about. That's what this whole thing is about. And we got interrupted for our, from our purpose that God created us for by sinning. And that's what brought death about. We sinned against God. And that shows you how important it is to obey God because that derailed the purpose that God created us for. But can't nothing stop what God going to do. So, of course, he had a plan for that. It ain't like he didn't know that was going to happen, but he showed you what it was supposed to be. That's why when you understand death was not mentioned except in regards to disobedience. So, therefore, it wouldn't have been no death if it wouldn't have been no disobedience. And like I saw Brother Wayne this morning, he did a good lesson, and he said something that struck me that's, that's very true. He said, look, Satan is crafty. He going to offer you something, but it's something you already got access to, but he going to get you to disobey to try to get it. You know, for instance, Satan told Adam and Eve, you know, do so and so. You ain't going to die. You going to be like God. Look, they already was on the road to being like God if they just would obey God. But he derailed them. That's the real three-card molly. They was already had it on the road to being God. He told them, look, come over here and do this. This going to see God trying to stop you. No, God told you what not to do. So we're going to get into a man created by God to be God. And it's, it's that simple, brothers and sisters. And that's, what, that's why this is too important to be messing around and mess up because we're trying to be God. Some brothers even got it right. Some, even some Muslim brothers, they be walking around talking about, hey, what's up, God? What's up, God? Well, they kind of got that right. But they don't understand that it's in living color. We actually going to be God just like them. We just got derailed temporarily. But now. 1 Samuel 2, which is really not particularly on the, on, the, on the topic of the lesson, just something I want to read because all of this that we understand and what we do every Sabbath and uh, reading the scripture on our own is all to get knowledge about our God and what he's trying to show us so we can become God. Don't you think if you, whatever you do in this world, whatever you're trying to accomplish in this world, it takes some knowledge to accomplish it. And they teach, you know, we tell kids, oh, stay in school. You know, we've been saying that for years. Get your education, you know. Why? Why do they need to get education? Because that's going to better them in this life, right? So why is it that we want to dumb down when it comes to the word of God? That's the only place you don't need no knowledge. Oh, just believe. Believe what? You don't need no knowledge when it comes to God. That's amazing to me. Matter of fact, the Bible said God created this whole world by knowledge and wisdom. Look, if man can create great things and great skyscrapers and build cities and do great stuff with knowledge, what do you think about the world and this, just looking up at the sky? Like it say, the firmament, the heavens declare the glory of God. But he did that with knowledge. It takes more knowledge than what, what God did than what man do to build a skyscraper. Because man can't touch it. Let man, man have done some great stuff. Tell him go mess around with the sun. Tell him even get close to it. Man can't touch the sun. But guess what? God put it out there. That's the power that God got. So this is what these, this kind of like a little prelude, little introduction. Uh, just showing you that everything is based on knowledge. So when we sit here and read all these scriptures, get knowledge, that's what it's about. First uh, Samuel 2, 1 Samuel 2, and this sister has some knowledge, and she was spouting it out right here. This sister Hannah, tell me a sister can't prophesy. So I know the Lord can speak through anybody. I know he got order, but the Lord speak through anybody at any given moment. And he's speaking through this sister right here. 1 Samuel 2, and work, go ahead, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Uh -huh. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. That's right. Go ahead. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies uh -huh. because I rejoice in thy salvation. See, now she was happy because she was in being antagonized and the Lord had blessed her to get pregnant. She gave birth to this great prophet Samuel here. She gave birth to him. The Lord blessed her with him. But she had, she had made a deal to, to offer him to the Lord. That's why Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. But the Lord gave us some other kids to replace that. So she is 
praising the Lord because of that. She said, I rejoice in thy salvation. Go ahead, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord. That's right. Go ahead. For there is none beside thee. Uh huh. Neither is there any rock like our God. See, there's no rock like the God of Israel. Go ahead. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Uh huh. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. Go ahead. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. Uh huh. And by him actions are weighed. See, now how you going to diminish getting some knowledge? And the Bible telling us that the Lord is a God of knowledge. And we don't think it's important to get some knowledge and understanding about God. We're going to go to church and just get emotional, sing and dance. That's all okay. But if you don't get no knowledge, that's all for nothing. You need some knowledge. See, that's why God got this big Bible here to show us about him. We don't know nothing about God unless he tell us. And he's telling us right here. He's telling us right here. See, when people get down, you know, I, I had people tell me, you know, because they trying to tell me something about God, and I'm showing them. So I said, look, let's get your Bible. You got your Bible? Get your Bible. We can look at it. And we start looking at stuff. And they still think some kind of way, you know, they really know God. But, you know, you see, you just know the Bible. But, see, I, I don't know the Bible like you. But, see, I know God. How you know God then? This is the only way. This is all the information we got about God come from here. If you... If you believe, but this is what is telling you that the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. So he see everything that's going on. Now go to Luke 11 because we're going to see the problem. Why don't nobody care about knowledge? I mean, people down right nowadays that say they believe in God. A lot of them, they downright reject knowledge. It's like an insult, you know. Why are you doing all that reading? People have come to our church and said it was just oh, it was overkill. Just too much reading. Just too much. Just too much reading. I mean, you wouldn't go nowhere and say that. It's always just too much. They just read too much. I was looking for a word from the Lord. And they sitting there reading. But we reading the word of the Lord. That's what's amazing. But that just shows you people don't like knowledge. And he tell you that in Proverbs, that people don't like knowledge. He said, because you have rejected knowledge. He tell you, matter of fact, he say that all over. But now, we're going to read just uh, Luke 11. Show you that even Jesus saw this was a problem from the priests of his day, and we got the same problem now. Luke 11, and we're going to read that one verse, verse 52. Luke 11 and verse 52. Okay, go ahead, my brother. Woe unto you lawyers. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. See, this is the problem nowadays. This is the problem. This is why we don't have people dispensing knowledge in our, in our average church or even mosque or places that we go to worship. We don't have people really focused on giving knowledge because they trying to really dumb us down and keep us blind. They keep us blind. You go seeking some knowledge, you in the wrong place. You even start questioning the preacher too much. He going to let you know you're in the wrong place. He's like, you know, you start questioning him. Say, well, can you show me that in the Bible? He ain't showing you nothing in the Bible. That's why they read a half a verse most of the time and give a two-hour, hour sermon and a whole lot of singing and dancing. But the lawyers that Jesus is referencing is the same as nowadays the preachers. Not what we would think of lawyers that, that practice law in society. These were religious lawyers. So nowadays they don't really call them lawyers because they ain't trying to deal with the law at all. They ain't trying to deal with the law of God nowadays. But they do give them a title. Some of them, they get real sophisticated and go to school. What do they call them? They call them doctors, right? They say, oh, this is doctor, reverend doctor, so-and-so, so-and-so. So they still give them a lofty title. Well, this was them back there. Same people. We talking about church leaders. He called them lawyers. What did he say? He said, woe unto you lawyers. What have you done? These are leaders. For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. See, the Bible said God is a, the Lord is a God of knowledge, but everybody not trying to give us that knowledge from God. That's why don't nobody in the average church don't know none of these things. Just like we celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Today is the sixth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Don't nobody know about it. We celebrating the weekly Sabbath today, the seventh day of the week. Don't nobody know, but they all going to be going to church tomorrow because they don't have no knowledge about it. 
And don't even think it matters. You ask them about, oh, it don't really matter what they, what Bible you read that in? You can't, see, that's some bad knowledge. That's what Adam and Eve got from Satan. They got detoured from the truth of the matter. So he said, woe unto these lawyers, though, for they have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourself. They're not going to get into the kingdom. All these so-called preachers that's misleading people, they're not getting in. They ain't have no intention of getting in. They don't even care about it. It's a game to them. But worse than that, he said, them that are entering, you hindered. Them that were entering. So the people that's trying to get in, because people don't go to church to be deceived. A lot of times people go to church because they want to find out about God, but they're getting duped. And Jesus warning you. So knowledge is the key, even in Jesus' estimation. But now, go to uh, Jeremiah 3. Because, see, we don't know what we should be getting from these men of God, so they're giving us anything. That's why don't nobody in the average church, know the people in the average church, they never heard of such a thing that you were created to be God. They never heard of that. That's some knowledge well written all over the Bible, but they never heard of that because they preach and haven't given them no knowledge. They withholding the key of knowledge. They never heard of you need to fear God and keep his commandments. That's what's going to help you fulfill your purpose. But now, uh, Jeremiah 3, let's show you that this is what the kind of leaders, of men, of God, that God want us to have. Jeremiah 3 and one verse again, verse 15. Okay, go ahead, my brother. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Now, this is future. It's going to happen wholesale because right now, Jesus told us in the last day there shall be many false prophets, not a handful, not a couple, two or three, many false prophets, and they will deceive many. That's what we got for the most part. We got those same lawyers, leaders, who holding back the key of knowledge because some of them know a lot more than what they tell people. We talk to some preachers and some preachers say, oh, man, we, I, yeah, I know Christmas pagan, but they don't want to hear that. So they just give people what they want. Keep them dumbed down. But this is the kind that the Lord ultimately going to give the people, and they few and far in between now. But you're going to know by their actions. You see, any man of God can say, oh, I'm a man of God. I was sent by God. He talked to me and told me to go preach. But you got to determine that for yourself. How are you going to determine it? Because they're going to be doing what God wants them to do, and that is give you some knowledge. He said, what are you going to do? Saw that 15 again? Go ahead. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Which shall do what? Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Why? Because God is a God of knowledge, right? So we got to get out of it in our average church that knowledge is bad. It's like knowledge is a bad thing. I'm telling you, I actually was trying to read some stuff in Revelation one time. A sister, she he basically closed my Bible. I said, let me show you something right here. They talk about it in Revelation. She started reading and looked. She said, oh, that scared me. I don't want to read that. Look, what you think it's in the Bible for? It's in the Bible so you can know it. If it scared you good, maybe you will use that to do the right thing. Sometimes you need to be scared. Sometimes you need to be sad. I can read that to you. Read John 16 on your own. Jesus said, because I told you so and so, so and so, sorrow have filled your heart. But, hey, I told you the truth. It's so big. Whatever it is, it is what it is. You need to know this. We think church is about going somewhere and feeling good, feeling, getting the emotional feel. Hey, that's okay. That got a place. But that's not the purpose of you going to church. You need to go get some knowledge, no matter how it make you feel. Sometimes it'll step on your toes. To this day, I read certain things in the Bible. I'm like, oh, that hit hard. I got to watch myself in that area. So that's what it's about. He said, I will give you pastors according to mine heart. These are pastors according to God's heart. They're not going to feed you with a bunch of emotionalism, jump and shout, feel good. That's why we don't have people. You know, if you get excited around here and want to run, you know, that's fine. But for the most part, we don't have nobody doing that, do we? Even when the choir sing, it might make you feel good. I want to wave my hand in the air. If I do like I don't care, it's okay. But. The bottom line is I know what's most important, getting some knowledge. That's what's important. He said, I will give you paths according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge 
and understand. That's what we need to get fed with. So we're going to get into some from this particular lesson. Let's go to Genesis 1. Man created by God to be God. That's some knowledge that most people don't know. That's the, that's the purpose we were created for, and we don't know that. That's why when you understand it, then you, you know you got to do a lot for this. Because just think if it takes getting a good education, getting some knowledge to become, you know, a great person in this world, to get a high position, to become president or CEO of some company. They don't just get that to anybody. They didn't just allow Barack Obama to become president. Hey, he had a lot of knowledge. Use words. Sometimes I'd be looking at what the heck that mean? What the, what did he say there? So, but he had a lot, he went to school a long time, got a lot of knowledge to be able to accomplish that. So now, if it takes knowledge to excel in this world, how you think you just going to accidentally become God without knowing anything? No, it's going to take some knowledge. But now, Genesis 1. This is when God created man, and we're going to pick it up at verse 26. Genesis 1 and 26. Man created by God to be God. Nothing less. Go ahead. And God said, let us make man in our image uh -huh. after our likeness. So now God is talking. You know, you got some people that still don't understand. And some people lose an understanding knowing that Jesus was God in the beginning. I said that, but we can prove that from the Bible. So I don't even have to prove that from the New Testament. I, I, I understand that right here that it was more than one because somebody is talking to somebody. Somebody talking here. What did he say? He said, God said, let us. That means it's more than one of them. Now, somebody quickly said, oh, that's just the angels. Well, we can see whether or not it's angels or not because they're they talking to somebody identical to them, and that's how they're going to make man. Angels, man don't look like angels. See, angels have a different image. Some angels, they got wings. and God don't have no wings. You ain't never heard of God with no wings. You ain't never heard of him looking like with four faces and all that like he's telling you the cherub angels look in Ezekiel, the first chapter. Got four faces. Got a face of a, uh, a man on one side, a face of an ox on one side, and they can walk and they don't even have to turn. I guess so. If they got a face over there. If you got a face that way and a face in the back, you ain't got to turn around and go that way. You just go that way. Because you got a face going every which and way. But man don't look like that. Matter of fact, if we saw a creature similar to that, we will fall out. Even if we saw an angel looking like a man, we'd fall out if he showed up somewhere we wasn't expecting him. You know, you, for instance, they always talking about, well, I was on my couch in my living room. Look, you have an accident if he really showed up. It would be an accident. Because you sitting on your couch, all of a sudden you look over there, you see, you see somebody over there out the corner of your eye. We're going to have a problem. That's why a lot of times when an angel showed up, the first, you know, of course, quite not, the people got scared. Got scared to death. What the heck going on? And the angel said, fear not. I come to give you some knowledge. Guess what? Give you some information about something. So the bottom line is, it said, and God said, let us make man in our image. So he is talking to somebody with the same image and likeness. Go ahead. After our likeness. Uh -huh. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. See, that's an indication what God, what God is making this man for in the first place. Right off the bat, he said, let him have dominion. Let him have dominion over everything. See, so God made everything for man. And then he's had the whole thing laid out and said, this is your domain. Now, have at it. This is all for you. This is what God is saying. This is, and I'm talking about all. This is all for you. Like I mentioned earlier, briefly, I mentioned man can't do nothing with the sun. But guess what? Man's supposed to be able to do something with the sun because that's part of God's creation, right? God created that part of his creating. He created the sun and the moon on the fourth day and the stars on the fourth day. And then when he created man on the sixth day, he said, this is your domain. Have at it. You suppose had dominion and act in actuality. He mean over everything, brothers and sisters. Absolutely everything. 
You say, well, how are you going to have control over the sun? God got control over the sun. If, 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 if it made God too hot, I guarantee he could say, just lighten up a little bit. And the sun will cool down. Just like Joshua, he gave you an indication in Joshua 10. Joshua was killing some people. God do some killing too. God says it's a time to kill and it's a time to heal. He had Joshua killing them people. He was killing them all day. So much so the sun was going to go down. And once it get night, people start hiding. You can't get them, right? Joshua stopped and told the sun to stop right there. He said, stop right there, son. And the sun obeyed him. Didn't go down. It stayed light. He kept killing. So, so the cycle didn't get off. It just stayed there for a whole 24 hours. It just went down the next day. See, God, is he keep everything in order. So even though that, was, that usurped the order, he let it stay in order because he just let it stay there for a whole day. He ain't going to let it stay there for 12 hours. And then now it's all out of whack, right? He said, we just miss a day this time. It's going to stay light. And actually, it's going to stay light when the Lord himself come back. He said, it's going to be a day like none other at evening time. Zechariah 14 it shall still be light. But that's an example how the man had control over the sun. And that's the power we're supposed to have. So he's, right now he mentioned a few lightweight things. He said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl and cattle, all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth on it. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. So he created man in his own image. In whose image? In God's image. Didn't say nothing about no angel, right? It says, so God created man in his own image. But wait a minute. Who was talking in the beginning? God was talking, right? Verse 26 said, and God said, let us make man in our image. I thought I liked it. Verse 27 says, so God created man. Wait a minute. Is God schizo? He's sitting there talking to himself. He's talking to himself. Let us make man in our image. Okay, I think I'll do that. And he did it. No, it was more than one right there. God, one God, which really is the Father, he talking, let us make man in our women. And the other, it wasn't no father, son, it was just God, because that's all it said, right? It said, God said, let us make man, but one of them later became known as the Father and the Son. But one of them said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And they said, the other one, so God created man. Or else he talking to himself, brother and sister. And we know he not schizo. No, he told the other, let us do this. And the other said, you got it. That's why Jesus said, I always do those things that please my father. He's been doing that a long time. He created man, and notice it said, in his own image. That's why when Jesus came, Philip said, before he left, Philip said, well, why, you know, you're talking about the father. Why don't you just show us the father? He said, man, how long I've been with you, Philip? You ain't known. If you see me, you see the father. So that's a dual image. Same likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. So we was made in God's image to begin with. That's the indication we was made to be God because we made in his image. He didn't even make the angels in his image, brothers and sisters. He made man in his image. And we eventually, since we're going to be God, we're going to be over the angels. And people don't understand that. But this is knowledge that's readily accessible in our Bible. It's right in our Bible if we just read it. So he created man in his image. Well, how did he make him? Go ahead. In the image of God created he him. Uh-huh. Male and female created he them. See, he made man male and female. So you don't have to have no distinction. That's a distinction that man made up calling a woman woman. But actually woman is man. You know, just like a horse. A horse is a horse, a horse, of course. You don't have to say a horse stress. You know it. No, you know, you say a horse, it could be one or the other, male or female. It's still a horse. So that's how man is. Go to uh, Psalm 8. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 28, my fault. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. See, that's something else. That lets you know God been doing some stuff a long time. It was something prior to them. Because else he wouldn't have said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. See, we're just getting a little tit, tidbit of what God want to show us. we just getting the tip of the iceberg. It was something going on because else he would not have said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. That means it was something prior to them. Ain't no telling how long something been on this earth. God could have been redoing this, putting this on the earth, putting that on the earth. But something was this or else he wouldn't have said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish. He told Noah that. 
in Genesis 9. But the difference in him telling Noah that we saw what was prior to Noah. We saw that he had drowned all of mankind. In Genesis 9, when he told Noah the same thing, him and his children, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. But we saw what was before. We just don't really see what was before here because ain't nothing before this but in, written, written for our edification. But it's there. Like the Bible said in Deuteronomy 29, it said the secret things belong to the Lord. So I ain't going to worry about something that's just a secret. I ain't going to even beat myself up over that. But I, what I know is what I know and what I'm, de- what I'm concerned with. So he said... Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And what else? And subdue it. And subdue it. Go ahead. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, Mm -hmm. and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So he gave him dominion over everything. And and really, it means absolutely everything. It even means, because see, it's over everything that God created. See, God did this grand scale of a creation, and he said, look, this is for you, man. You supposed to have dominion over it, but you got to grow up to that capacity. Just like man been growing for the time we've been on earth. It took man thousands of years to get to the point where he got all of this modern technology and got the capabilities that he have now. It took him thousands of years to get to that point. So it's a, it's a growing process. Same thing with having dominion over absolutely everything. It's a growing process. We just at the tip now. Go now. Go to Psalm 8. Psalm the 8th chapter. Psalm the 8th chapter. And he going to get into it a little bit. Psalm 8. And verse 1. Okay, go ahead, my brother. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Uh-huh. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Okay, so now he talk, he prays in the Lord. He said, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Then he go on the side of the mouth of babes. That's why when they was praising, the, 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 the young people was praising Jesus. He said, have you not read out of the mouth of babes? Has he ordained strength? But go ahead, verse 3. When I consider thy heavens uh-huh. and the work of thy fingers. See, God created the heavens. He created the sky and the sun and the moon, the star. All those things are the work of God's fingers. So that seems Great. Man seems small in comparison to those things. Because right now, we don't have the control over absolutely everything. That's why the only thing you do when it gets too cold, you try to get some shelter. You don't have no control over that. I was talking to Brother Fontaine earlier. I said, yeah, you know, we're talking about the difference in weather and it get cold. But I say, one thing about in, in, in Chicago area, hey, the killing stop when it get too cold. They go in the house. You're a big-time killer. You're a murderer. But you you can't take the cold, though. But well, you ain't running no mission. No, oh, man, I got to wait till July. It's cold out there. It's too cold. But God tell you that in the Bible. He said, who could stand before his cold? But the, the ultimate purpose, man, is supposed to have dominion over that. So what he said, he said, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, what else? The moon and the stars. Which thou hast ordained. The moon and the stars that you created, that you ordained. Go ahead. What is man that thou art mindful of him? He said, this stuff, this stuff is so great. I'm wondering why man is so special to you, God. Because there's some great stuff you done created. What is man? There's some great stuff right here. What is man? That's why man turned around and so dumb, he ended up worshiping the sun and the moon. Look, the Lord made the sun and the moon to benefit you and for you to have dominion over it. That's what even our Muslim brothers, a lot of Muslim brothers, they don't realize they ain't doing nothing worse than the moon. They got the final call in 79th Street in Chicago, Farrakhan spot, right outside the, on the building, big old star and a crescent moon. What's that about? You don't know you worshiping Alat, the moon goddess? That's all it was. The, 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 uh, the, the Arabians just switched it around and called it Allah, tried to mix it in and make it look like it's the same God of the Bible. 
But no, nah, it's Alat, the, the, the moon god. That's why God tell you in the Bible, don't worship that. I made that for your benefit. Don't worship the sun. That's why everybody go to church on Sunday. That's what's a Christian day. Because they want they still love the sun, want to worship the sun. Like it's a God, and God created you to be God over that stuff. That's amazing. That's amazing. So he said, so it is some great creation. So he said, what is man that you mind for of him? And what else? Finish verse 4. And the son of man that thou visitest him. Go ahead. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. See, right now, in our present state, brothers and sisters, right now we lower than the angels. The angels are greater than us. That's for sure. But in the end, we're going to be higher than them. That's why he said, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. We just haven't got there yet. But we was created to be over the angels. Because guess what? The angels are the work of God's hands. God created them too, right? Okay, so if we supposed to be over all the works of his hand, we supposed to even be over the angels. And that's unimaginable when you got a, a, a limited mind, when you got limited knowledge, but that's the way it is. I told some people that, they said, what you mean, we're going to be over angels? They said, that's blasphemy. You're trying to take something from God. No, God giving it to us. He giving it to us. He said, for thou hast made him a little lower than angels and has crowned him with glory and honor, verse 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hand. Now, that's absolute, over the works of your hands. He mean everything, too. He ain't just talking about the cattle and stuff. Well, go ahead. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Oh, that's absolute right there. Thou hast put all things under his feet. It just haven't came to pass yet. Go ahead. All sheep and oxen, mm -hmm. yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Go ahead. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's right. Now go right quick to Hebrews 2. Show you how this Bible go together perfectly. It's going to be like we was reading the same thing. But it's going to complement it itself. And it's going to explain it a little more. That's how you get understanding. That's how you get knowledge. You read it where you find it at, where it go together. Put the pieces together like a puzzle. Hebrews 2 and verse 5. Go ahead. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. See, he letting you know the angels not going to run the world, the future world. Who going to run the future world? Mankind. Mankind. But we not going to be mankind no more because we, we was created to be what God is. We was created to be God. So we not going to be in this same estate. Not even going to have this same body. So, but it, what he letting you know is that angels, see the angels pulling things, pulling the strings behind the scenes now in this world. They behind the scenes doing stuff for God. But see, God going to be doing it himself because he's going to have many more like him in the, in the world to come. So that's what he's telling you. He said, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. That's the kingdom that's coming. Notice it ain't about you going to heaven. None of this is about going to heaven, flying around and you know, around heaven up there. It's going to be right here on the earth. It's going to be a kingdom coming. He said, you haven't put in subjection, the angels in, put the world to come in subjection to the angels, where we speak, but, but who? Verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, mm -hmm. what is man that thou art mindful of him? Oh, he started quoting Psalm 8. He said, I'm going to tell you who's going to be running the world to come. Well, one in a certain place testified already. See, again, how are you going to take the Old Testament and lead the New Testament when it's saying the same thing or vice versa? How are you going to take the New Testament and say, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian, but I don't need that old Old Testament. Look, the New Testament ain't doing nothing repeating it right here. It's going to shine the light on it a little bit for you, though. He said one in a certain place testified saying, what did he testify? What is man that thou art mindful of him, uh -huh. or the son of man that thou visitest him? Verbatim. Go ahead. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned, crowned him with glory and honor, uh -huh. and didst set him over the works of thine hands. That's what's coming. Go ahead. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Go ahead. For in that he put all in subjection under him, 
he left nothing that is not put under him. Ah, uh, see, he he mean absolutely everything, brother. So when he say all things, he mean all things, cause God created it all. Everything that God created, this whole creation was put together for us. That's how great we are in God's eye. And you could tell already, cause we made in His image. That's why man and conquered everything in his in his way. Even used to have problems with the animals overrunning man. Man, the animals ain't no problem now. He put the animals, he put the animals to sleep and let them wake up when you tell them to wake up. So I'm gonna put I'm gonna put them out for a while. And and let them wake up. That's how much control man got now. But didn't always have that control like that. Didn't even realize it. But came up with a way to subdue the animals. Put them in cage and look at them at the zoo. Animals can't do that to man. Animal ain't got no zoo for man. He said, look, I'm gonna show you these people here. <laughs> uh-uh. It's vice versa. So that show you who in subjection. Man is the one trying to save some animals. Well, they're endangering the species. We don't want to lose, we don't want to lose the whole species. So we're gonna ban them. You can't be killing none of them. You know, so man has got it in subjection get to that degree. But he said, verse 8, thou hast put all things under subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. That's back to the sun and the moon and everything and even the angels. That is not put under him, but not yet. Go ahead, finish verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Notice he put that yet in there. Because we ain't got it yet. Because we haven't reached our full potential. You want to talk about some potential. This is the ultimate in potential, brother and sister. We got the potential. All we got to do is stay the course. We got the potential to be God. That's what eternal life. People always tell me, I'm going to live forever. How? How are you going to live forever? In what state? What, what you going to be? What kind of body are you going to have? Nobody even thought about a body. You know what I'm saying? You need a body to live forever. What, you just going to be floating around somewhere? We ain't thought of none of that. Because preachers ain't told us nothing. They just told us to pay some tithes. They got that straight, don't they? Yeah, we're going to have a little show, then you bring your money. That's all we worried about. But you got all this information God wants you to know. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we got our prime example, verse 9. But we see Jesus, mm -hmm. who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, uh -huh. crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. See, but we see Jesus, our example. See, he had to be put in opposition, so he was made lower than the angels, just like us, because that's what we at. So he was made Lord of angels so he could die and die for us because our mission, our purpose got derailed by disobeying. But Jesus set us back on straight. He set us back on the path to being, fulfilling our destiny, fulfilling our purpose. That's to be God. He came and became a man, died. He basically leading us out to prison. So now we can fulfill our destiny. We see Jesus who went through the same thing, but see, he got it already. When he came out the grave, he got crowned with glory and honor, and he got dominion over everything. See, he already had the mindset when he was a man because he knew where he came from. That's why he out there, he ain't trying, he wasn't worried about no boat, the disciples on a boat. He already got the mindset. He come walking on water. Scared them to death. They're like, what the heck going on? And I'm talking about he walked, you know, you had the magician trying to do it. He had a magician. He walked across the pool or something. He probably had some shoes on, whatever. He walked across the pool. Look, when you read when Jesus walked on water, he was walking miles. I'm talking about walking miles because they had been gone sailing on a boat, and he caught up with them. Matter of fact, it tell you like some furlongs. So he caught up with them and passed them by one time. It was like, what the heck going on here? Scared them to death. Then when they saw him one time, even Peter, he got a little nervous. Said, Lord, can I let me let me, can me come out there and walk with you on the water? He said, Come on. He came out there for a few seconds and realized, I ain't supposed to be doing this. What the heck going on? So he didn't keep the faith, because that's he didn't feel he had dominion over that right now. See, Jesus already felt it. That's why he's doing it. But now, so Jesus got it all back when he died and resurrected. He got crowned with glory and honor, and he died to bring us out. Taste death for every man, verse 10. For it became him 
for whom are all things uh -huh. and by whom are all things. That means he was the one that created in the beginning. By whom are all things. They were for him and by him. Go ahead. What, what, what did they become him to do, though? In bringing many sons unto glory uh -huh. to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. See, he, he, he is our captain, and he made it perfect by suffering to bring us out. But now, let's go to John 10, because they hated Jesus back then, so I'm not surprised when people hate him nowadays. Because they couldn't get with the fact that he said he was God in the beginning, but he could fall back on the fact, look, we all supposed to be gods. Y'all didn't know that? That's what he ended up telling them. Because they were saying he blasphemed me. That's what they're saying in a minute. They don't know what God is doing here. John 10, and we're going to pick it up at verse 30. See, they had a big problem with Jesus, so having a problem with Jesus is nothing new. They had a problem back here with him. John 10 and 30. Go ahead, my brother. I and my father are one. See, he said, I and my father are one. Now, that was... That was like stoning, getting stone business right there. And that's what they did. What they do? Go ahead. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> See, they ready. They ain't, we ain't going to ask no question. What did he say? Did you get them rocks? They ain't even ask no question. He said, I am my father. He putting himself on par with God. We dare him do that. But then he already had been God. But even more importantly, he could tell them, look, this is your destiny. You're supposed to understand that you was created to be God. That's what he got you going to let them in on that little secret. Go ahead, 32. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. Uh -huh. For which of those works do you stone, that's do you stone me? That's amazing. A man ain't did nothing wrong, ain't do nothing but good, and you trying to kill him. Because he tell it, because he teaching something that you're not used to. That's the same way with us. We ain't doing nothing wrong. We're not going around causing no disturbances, but they people don't like us, and eventually they're going to come looking for it. We ain't causing no disturbances. We ain't causing no uprising. We, only uprising we causing is a spiritual uprising. Tell you, stop doing, stop worshiping them false gods and start honoring the true God. But that's revolutionary. And eventually they're going to see, and they're going to come looking for the ones that's, that's that's instigating it. But go ahead. That's what they was doing with Jesus. He said, which I, which the, I, I did many good work. Tell me which one you stoning me for. Go ahead. The Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee not. Go ahead. But for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. See, and that's what people would say to us when we, like even a lesson like this. I, you know, you can hear people say, oh, let's, how can he say that? Man created to be God. That's black. Well, Tell me what the purpose was then. This is the purpose. Matter of fact, this is what this whole creation is about. All this, the sun and the moon, it's about man being God. The beast and the fish, it's about man being God. The whole creation is about man being God, and we don't know that. That's what the creation is about. That's the real creation here, brothers and sisters. But go ahead. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are God. Now, Jesus, that's, what, that's what's good about Jesus. He didn't go outside nowhere. He didn't come up with something foreign to them. No, he hit them where they lived. That he, you know, the Bible that you claim to believe in, y'all claim to believe in the law. That's why they was called lawyer. Y'all claim to believe in law. Is it not written in your law? Because the whole Old Testament is called law, by the way. It's not just the law of Moses. Most people don't understand that. Sometimes the New Testament quote Isaiah is called it law. Here, Jesus, we're going to read it. He quoting Psalm. And he's calling it law. But what did he say? They accused him of blasphemy because he put himself on par with God. Then he turned around and hit them. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. So God already been calling man gods according to Jesus. Go ahead, verse 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. See, he said he called them gods. He basically said, y'all didn't know that. That's written in your Bible. He already called. We all supposed to be God. So don't think that's so, you know, uh, hefty that I can be uh, called the son of God. That's what the son of God really is. The son of God going to be what his father is, God. So he said, if he called them gods whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Why you what? Go ahead. Say ye of him 
whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? He said, you think that's some big stuff because I said I'm the Son of God when all uh, man was created to be God. And he didn't make nothing up. He just gave him the script. He says, it's written. So let's go back and read it. It behooved us. People say you don't need the Old Testament. But if Jesus is quoting it, don't it behoove us to go back and read it? This is what Jesus is quoting to you. So much for the Old Testament being done away with unimportant. Psalm 82. Let's go back to when he said it. And show you. See, this, this lets you in on the secret that God's mindset and intentions from day one was to be God. See, and once you live in this life long enough, you know this flesh and blood don't add up. The older you get. See, I don't look that old, but I'm starting to feel it. Stuff don't be working the same, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Knee just get caught for no reason. Be like, what, what, what the heck? You can't, can you imagine you just sit down too long? You messed up. Stuff be stiff. Went to sleep. Wake up. Hey, I wake my leg up. You need something else, don't you? This ain't all it's cracked up to be. Psalm 82 and 1. But the good news is we're going to get out of this if we, and we fulfill our purpose, our destiny, and become what God made us for to be God. Psalm 82 and 1. Go ahead. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. Uh-huh. He judgeth amongst the gods. See, that's plural, ain't it? And he ain't talking about some other gods like, you know, you got Olympus and all these man-made gods. He's not talking about none of them Hercules and all them. He's talking about the ones he created, mankind. Ain't nobody else outside of that. He's talking about mankind. It said, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. See, that's the way God is already looking at us. Because he know what he made us for. He know I made you to be God. That's why everybody that's created, guess how long you're going to live? You're going to live forever. Just on, on what side of the track? He's either going to be in a bad state or a good state. But you're going to live forever because that's the way God made you. He said he judges among the gods. Verse 2. How long will ye judge unjustly uh -huh. and accept the persons of the wicked? See what he's talking about? He judges among the gods, but he's talking to man. Those in lead, especially start with Israel and even those leading even to this day, judging unrighte unrighteously, not doing good or just to the poor. He going to tell you some of that. Verse three. Selah. Mm -hmm. Defend the poor and fatherless. Uh -huh. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. But he talking to the God. But really he talking to the people that's in charge. That's leading. Go ahead. Deliver the poor and needy. Mm -hmm. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. That's right. They know not. Mm -hmm. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Mm -hmm. I have said, ye are God. Uh, see, he said it. He said, I have said, ye are God. I'm not playing about it, but we do have a problem. You was originally going to go straight into being God because it was just it's, it just was going to be evolution, brother and sister. We was going to grow, grow, grow into being God. Now we got, for the most part, we got to die and wake up being God. But before, it wasn't going to be no death because death wasn't mentioned until disobedience came in. You was just going to grow into being God. He showed you an example with Enoch. That's exactly what happened to Enoch. You got some brothers running around here now talking about Enoch is dead. But the Bible said clearly Enoch didn't die. I mean, you got a litany of everybody that died. Everybody died. In Genesis 5, he go through. Adam died. He had a, But he had a son. Kept it going. Seth. Seth died, but he had a son. Jared or somebody. They all kept dying, right? They died. Did it get down to Enoch? It said, and Enoch was not, for God took him. In other words, Enoch disappeared. Nobody saw, heard from him again. He was just gone. And the New Testament confirmed in Hebrews 11 said that Enoch didn't taste death. Had a brother try to quote that. Well, it said he didn't taste death, but that don't. <laughs> Boy, people get too smart for their own good. <laughs> Who actually really tastes death anyway? <laughs> like right before it died. I taste. <laughs> Brothers get too smart, boy. They get too smart. They fool themselves. Like my teacher, Brother Boo, used to say all the time. He's, he's back in the day in the 80s, boy. I used to hang out with these brothers. It was brothers called the East Side. We hang out. And I got away from them because they wasn't doing nothing after church. They'd be smoking weed. And that's what I did. So, you know, I was, of course, I was with them. I always found the bad ones. 
But then finally, I got away from my brother. Boy, he said, yeah, them, Jay, them Hebrews, Elijah, they after... After they learn a lesson, they go and poke each other's eyes out. Coming up with them, they go poke each other's eyes out. And that's what people do sometimes. Just make it up some stuff. Make it up. Yeah, yeah, see, that's that. It's easy to come up with some new stuff, but you got to validate it. So that's what happened. But what he said here, he said, I said, ye are gods, and all you are what? And all of you are children of the Most High. All you are children of the Most High. So that was the purpose we was created for. But we got derailed. Go ahead. But ye shall die like men. See, that was that's what derailed us. But we end up dying like men. We end up dying. Go ahead. And, sh and fall like one of the princes. And fall like one of the princes. Ultimately, that's what happened to Satan. But go ahead. Arise, O God. Judge the earth, uh -huh. for thou shalt inherit all nations. He's going to inherit all nations. Notice it's still not taking you to heaven nowhere. But notice he called, this is what Jesus quoted. I said ye are God. That was the purpose we was created to be God. We just fell by the wayside. And Enoch, God always gives you an example. You might say, because God said all men have sinned and all fallen short. But see, God do what he want to, to show you, uh, uh, you know, there's exceptions to the rule. So Enoch is just one great exception to the rule. And that ain't no big thing because out of the billions upon billions of people that have been on earth, you only got one that didn't make it, that didn't die. Hey, that's really an exception, isn't it? He's an exception. He just kept on living, and he's still living now. And people say, well, way yet if he's still alive. Who knows and who cares? He's still alive. It ain't no big deal when you're immortal. It ain't even like, like they act like he bored. He's sitting around not doing nothing. <laughs> He ain't got nothing to do. Look, God said a thousand years to us is a day to him. So that ain't nothing, ain't not. Because you in a whole nother realm when you're an immortal. You don't think the same time. It's not dimension. It's none of that. So he not bored. He not somewhere like, I can't wait till it's over with. No. He's still around, though. Because it said he did not die. But that's what would have happened to all of us, brothers and sisters, if it had not been for sin. Enoch is that example. We just would have lived, lived, and then, and then just evolved into an immortal being. And it's even going to happen to some people still because Enoch is an example of that. Jesus is the prime example because he is the one died. He's the only one that died and was born again. See, Enoch didn't die. Jesus is the first to die and be born again. And go back into the God family. So he's the first to do that. But even at the second coming of Jesus, guess what? I'm hoping we among us, there's a few people going to be living who ain't going to never die. That would be all right with me. You're just going to get that change like Enoch got. See, Enoch is an example. See, that's why the Lord said there's no new thing under the sun. There's nothing new. Even when the Lord come back, split the sky, and, immor and mortals get changed into immortals, you can't say, oh, that's the first time that ever happened. Nope, Enoch already did it a long time ago. So now look, he said, ye shall, I said ye are gods and all you children of the most high, but you're going to die like men. And that's what derailed us. Let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Genesis 3. Let's look at the derailment. Because this got us off track for our purpose that we was created, and that's to be God. This got us off track. Death, that, that's what lets you know, brother and sister, you cannot make death pretty. I don't know how people go for that. Well, I know how they go for it because you don't really want to deal with death. You don't want to deal with the agony of death. You want to make it like death is not death. But guess what? It is what it is. Death is death. You can't make it pretty. It messed us up. It wasn't meant to be except for sin. So when they lying to you at a funeral, well, you know, so-and-so went to glory. No, that's not the order thing. She went to death and she's dead until the resurrection genesis 3 and 17 go ahead and unto adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife oh that don't sound good go ahead and has eaten of the tree of which i commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it go ahead cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So the ground got cursed, so we're going to have a hard life. None of this is pretty. So you can't get it to a funeral, which is the ultimate punishment for sin. You can't get there and tell me this is a pretty home going. People are confused. They be trying to turn, turn it into something else. 
even if you go there trying to dispense some knowledge, like I go sometimes do funerals and I'm trying to give them some knowledge, even before I get up, somebody undoubtedly put them in heaven. They get up say, oh, no, this ain't a funeral. Try to get everybody excited. This ain't a funeral. I don't even get mad. No. I say, I'm going to tear that mess up when I get up there. I don't even worry about it. I smile. Yeah, okay, we're going to see what it is in a minute. We're going to see exactly what it is. It is a funeral. Death wasn't meant to be pretty. Nothing pretty about none of this, brothers and sisters. It's because of sin. He said, Adam, because you disobeyed me, you listened to your wife, because Eve got tricked by Satan, and then she brought it to Adam. Say, oh, y'all ain't going to die. Y'all going to be like God. Yeah, you was on your way to being like God till you listened to him. You was on your way. Well, he going to give you the shortcut. That's the way it is. never a shortcut, brothers and sisters. So he said, look, curse is the ground for your sake and sorrow. You're going to eat of it all the days of your life, 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring, shall it bring forth to thee. Uh-huh. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Not good. Go ahead. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Uh-huh. Till thou return unto the ground. You can't get nothing else out of that. You can't get this going back to heaven, home going. I did, I did a lesson recently. I said, yeah, the only home going is back to the dust. We came from the dust. We going to the dust. That's what we going until the resurrection. That's what it's about. No pretty home going here. They say, oh, no, I see the spirit. It don't say nothing about no spirit here, by the way. But I know where spirit lead God, the breath that he put in your nostril. That's spirit. That's the spirit of life. He take that breath back to himself and you go to the dust. That's what he said here. You go into the dust. You got to wait there until the resurrection. That's why I said them that sleep in the dust going to wake up in the end. It's simple. He said, in the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you do what again? Till thou return unto the ground. For what? For out of it wast thou taken. And what else? For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You don't have to be too smart to figure that out. You going back to the grave, brothers. And we take people out there buried and try to imagine they somewhere else. We take them out and bury them, be there when they get buried, watch them go down. We Some people stay to the last minute. They watch them go all the way down, watch the people put the dirt on top of them and everything, and then they say, they gone to glory. What you go through all that for? And why you go out there to put flowers out there if they already gone to glory? And then when some uh, uh, bad happen, you know, some good happen, they say, oh, they smiling down. Here. But notice when some bad happen, they say, oh, they turning over in their grave. Wait a minute, where they at? Where are they really? Because you didn't imagine that something bad can happen and they got to deal with that. But the good news is they ain't got to deal with nothing. They don't know nothing until they wake up. Now, go to uh, verse 24. Skip to verse 24. Because I'm telling you that derailed us. Man sinning, he said you was made to be God. He said, I said you are God. Jesus quoted it, but you're going to die like men. And that's what derailed us. You can't be God and die. But go ahead, verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. See, now he say. Once he had messed up, he said, you can't have access to get to the tree of life because you got derailed from your purpose. Living forever was the purpose that he created man for. And you're going to live forever as a being called God. So he drove out the man and he blocked the way of the tree of life, which is really God himself. And what's the fruit that you get? You got to get the word of God. Just like the fruit from the tree of knowledge getting evil, it's some, it's some lying words, some false words. Well, you got to get the true words from God. But he blocked it now temporarily until he show you the way back to the tree of life so you can get back on track. But right here he said he placed at the east a garden of Eden cherubims, which is these angels, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. That's really keep the way of the Lord because the Lord is like, He's a tree of life, and he got these cherubims around. That's why I say the Lord God that dwelleth between the cherubim. They're like, what the Lord need bodyguards? I don't know, but that's what he got. I figure he can work it, but he got it set up that way. He got these cherubims all around him. Even when he had uh, Moses and Solomon build a tabernacle, it was set up that way with cherubims around the throne. And he's called the Lord God that dwelleth between the cherubim. But now, let's go to uh, Revelation 2. All the way to the end, we're going to get some understanding of this. See, 
This is the way you let the Bible explain itself. You read it here a little and there a little. So we leave in Genesis and we go into Revelation. Because other than that, we won't know, brothers and sisters. I used to, before I got some understanding, I used to try to read the Bible and get stuck on one verse and try to figure it out. Be scratching my head. What the heck that mean? And you don't even finish reading the Bible because you're trying to figure out one verse. What the, what the, he said so, so. You, you sit there all day racking your brain when, if you, when you get understanding, you know it's going to explain it somewhere else. It's going to make sense of it. Just like he took access from the tree of life, right? Who you think gave access back? That's what Jesus' job is. He died. He became a man to get us back on track. Genesis, uh, Revelation 2 and 7. Read that one verse. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's right. Go ahead. To him that overcometh. Notice you got something to do. He's not doing it all. You got to overcome. You got to do your part. To, but to him that overcometh, if you do, go ahead. Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? Notice, he got to give it back to you. He got to give you this access back. You still got to do what you're supposed to do. But notice, he got to give it to you because the access has been taken away temporarily. Then we see that he blocked it to keep you from getting to it. So you're not going to get eternal life until Jesus come and die. That's why I know it is through grace. But that don't mean we ain't got to do nothing because he said he did overcome it. But without Christ, we ain't got a chance because we all messed up. Once Adam messed up, that ruined us all and we ain't been no better. But Christ came to give us that access back. Go to John 15 now. John 15. And Jesus said he, he, was, he, was re he was emphasizing why they hated him. But again, he ain't doing number quote in the Old Testament scripture. And people, people hate Jesus today. Has some people talking about uh, he don't know nothing. He, see, he contradict the Old Testament. I say, I don't know. What Bible they read? He ain't saying nothing but what's in the Old Testament. Notice what he said here. John 15. It's all been foretold. 15 and 23. Go ahead, my brother. He that hateth me hateth my father also. See, they, see Jesus been hated. But he said, he that hateth me hateth my father also. Go ahead. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. Mm -hmm. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. See, he said, they, they hate me and my father. I did all this stuff, and they still hate me. That's amazing. And he took that. That's so you only God could do that. Because you let me have some power like that to do something as people acting crazy, I would quickly put them in their place. But, hey, he knew what he had to do. He knew the will of God that he let this go on because he had to be a sin offering. Sometimes we talk crazy, don't even have no power. I didn't talk crazy when I was in the world to the police. They ain't had a chance. I'm talking, they got me, y'all ain't going to do nothing. Y'all can't take me. And they got me naked in a rubber room before it's over with. Because I'm crazy. So you know if you really got some power to be able to do something, you know you're going to exercise it. But not God. God know he, he, he let them do all that he did to them because it fulfilled the greater mission to get us back on track for our purpose. He had to be a sin offering. So he said, they hate both me and my father, verse 25. And what is this fulfilling again? Go ahead. But this cometh to pass. That the world might be fulfilled that is written in their law. In, uh -huh. They hated me without a cause. See, again, fulfilling some more Old Testament stuff. Had to be fulfilled. He said the reason why this happened, y'all, that it might have fulfilled that is written in their law. Again, it's not the law of Moses per se. It's just meaning the Old Testament because the whole Old Testament referred to as law. It's written in Psalm. They hated me without a cause. Let's go read it in their law. Keep your finger in, in John. We're going to come right back. But go to Psalm 69. And then we're going to come back to John. The sixth chapter. Psalm 69. Let's see what he was quoting here. It behoove us to go back. Because you, you can't just call yourself a New Testament Christian. That's the problem. See, when they say they're a New Testament Christian, that means they just took some stuff and made it up and applied it to Christ. If you're a Bible Christian, you know, hey, the whole thing, you following Christ according to the whole Bible. 
Christ didn't bring nothing new in, in for those that have that understanding. Psalm 69 and verse 4. Go ahead. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They already foretold. They more than the hairs of my head. Hate him without a cause. Go ahead. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies, wrongfully, are mighty. And then I restored that which I took not away. See, this is amazing. See, this how I, this how I say, you know, people act like, with, oh, they made that New Testament up. That's play. Look, you couldn't even plagiarize that. How, only the one that knew that had this written would have known that what this meant. And, and pull this out of that in what he did in John 15. Only the one who know could have came up with that. Man ain't even smart enough to figure this one out, right? Who would have came up with quoting Psalm 69 talking about they hated me without a cause? Only the one had it written. He said they hated me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me being mine enemies wrongfully. Because he ain't did nothing wrong. Are mighty. Then he still said, I restored that which I took not. What did he restore? He restored the tree of life, the access. That's what he restored. He didn't even have a hand in taking it away, but he restored it. Go ahead, verse 5. Oh, God, thou knowest my foolishness. I'm sorry, skip to verse 9. That's, that's what I meant to do. Verse 9, go ahead. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Uh-huh. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. See, that's, that's Jesus talking again. They quoted this in John. It said, the zeal of your house have eaten me up. The reproaches of them that reproach thee, talking about the father, fell on him. In other words, he took the blunt up. He took the burden for it. He took the hit and died for us to get us back on track for our purpose. Now, let's go back to John 6. Back to John 6. So we, get, we did get derailed from our purpose. Man was created by God to be God. We got derailed by sin. Death derailed us. But guess what? We back on track. But this is the whole goal. This the goal. This has been the goal from the beginning. And the only way we can get back on track is a man paid a price for us, and that man was the Lord himself. He came to do it. John 6 and verse uh, 51. He's going to tell you that here. Go ahead. I am the living bread. Which came down from heaven. Uh huh. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. See, this is what it's about. It's about living forever. See, but people talk about eternal life and living forever, but don't have no real concept of it. This is what it was always been that we were supposed to live forever. And in what state? You got to have a body that's going to live forever. This body would have evolved, evolved into a body like God, but now we got to get it a different way. We got to die and wake up with a new body. But still, it's going to be eternal life. You got to eat this bread, though. See, that's eating from the tree of life again. You got to eat this bread. You're going to live forever. Go ahead. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. See, he had to die to get this back on track for us. He died. That's why he said he restored that he didn't take and reproach of them that reproached God, the father, fell on him. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, mm -hmm. how can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, they, they looking physical. This is much deeper than that. He ain't, we ain't, it's nothing you can eat physically that's going to give you eternal life. It's not physical eat. You got to believe what the gospel saying. Go ahead. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man mm -hmm. and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. See, he letting you know you got to do it. But he's just talking about hear the word and believe it. Even the word concerning him. Just like he written, we read, he was written about in Psalm. You got to believe that. Go ahead, 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Uh -huh. And I will raise him up at the last day. Notice that's how you're going to get it. You're not going to just... Die and go be with the Lord. No, you're going to die and wait to be resurrected at the last day. He made it plain. I read this at funeral, and, you know, boy, if you're talking about a choir, people don't even know, they don't even want to cry at a funeral because they be sitting there with their eyes wide open like, what the heck? I ain't never heard nothing. Some people get mad and walk out. I don't care. Some be looking mean. I get meaner, too. I get like Ezekiel. He said they going to make, they hard, they face going to be hard. Don't worry, but I'm going to make your face hard. Because we ain't doing nothing but reading the Bible. You offended because I'm reading the Bible? The one you got. 
You, you upset about it. So, but this is the way you're going to get eternal life now. It got derailed, so now you got to be resurrected. He said, I will raise him up at the last day. But it was predicated on you eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's speaking of what? Skip to verse 63. What is that really talking about? Because what is the fruit that comes from him? Notice it's him. He the one all along. He the tree of life. The father got life and he got life. They the tree of life and you eat the fruit that come from them, which is nothing but the word. 63. Go ahead. It is the spirit that quickened it. Mm -hmm. The flesh profited nothing. See, they, they, they worried about trying to, how we going to eat his literal flesh. Obviously, he didn't mean that. That ain't going to do nothing to make you sick, eating a man's arm off. That ain't going to do you no good. So they, 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 some of them got mad and actually left behind it. How, he, how we going to eat his flesh? That man crazy, man. Let's go. So they left. But Jesus finally broke it down. He said, it's the spirit. The spirit is what gives life. No flesh is going to give you no life. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Go ahead. The flesh profited nothing. What is spirit? The words that I speak unto you, mm -hmm. they are spirit and they are life. That's what we're eating right now. That's why we're getting this knowledge. Then we read, you need to be fed with knowledge and understand. Why? Jesus said, man don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is what we need. But now go to Ephesians 8. We're going to touch on this. Because we're going to touch on Ephesians 5. I'm sorry. We're going to touch on all the things that's entailed, entwined in us getting, reaching our goal. In this case, getting back on track because we got derailed by disobedience. We dying. Death wasn't a part of the original plan. God knew it was going to happen, but ultimately it only happened because we sinned because he told them in Genesis, the day you eat of this tree is the day you're going to die. If you never deal with the wrong individual and believe this false information he gives you, we'd never die. That's the only time death was mentioned. We'd be living forever. We just would have evolve so we could thank Adam and Eve for derailing us but thank the Lord for getting us back on track because we still back on track and we're going to reach our full potential which is what this whole thing is about uh, Ephesians 5 and 18 go ahead and be not drunk with wine mm -hmm. wherein is excess okay so drinking is okay but when you overindulge you don't need to do it and if you can't do it like I was without overindulging then you need to leave it alone period if your mind ain't equipped for it, you're too young, you need to leave it alone, period. But overall, drinking is not a sin. That's why he said, doing it too much. Be not drunk with wine in excess. But be what? But be filled with the spirit. See, we need to be filled with, but people don't even know what spirit it is. We just found out it's the word. Because that's what we eating, and that's what's going to lead us to eternal life. In essence, put us back on the path. To reaching our destiny. Go ahead. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. See, because you got something to marinate on once you got filled with. People talk about being filled with the Spirit. Don't have a clue what it is. Don't have no understanding. Don't have no knowledge of God. And they filled with the Spirit. You start asking. They can't tell you nothing. Because they not filled. That's why he said try the Spirit. They not filled with God's Spirit. Let's go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, we're going to see one more time what it is. Because we need to know what it is that it's going to take for us to get life and live forever and thereby be God. This is what's making us God, brothers and sisters. This is not something lightweight. If, if this is what I need to be God, I don't need all that emotional spirit that people are talking about. That's why I ain't got to be up here <laughs> jumping around and kicking because I don't need that. I don't need that at all because he's telling me what I need to get life. Now, if I need to do a dance and start dancing, then that's what I'll be doing. But I ain't read none of that. I ain't read nobody in the Bible that's filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus, the Bible said he was full of the Holy Ghost. You ain't see one time when he, he was dancing and going crazy, ran and knocked nobody out and had somebody fanning. You ain't seen none of that. Give me a headache sometime. I'll be just watching that stuff. I ain't lying. I, went, I go to a funeral sometimes. They do the same stuff at a funeral like they at church. Just boom, boom, all kind of noise, beating and beating and beating. My head started hurting. <laughs> but go ahead. What verse you at? Uh, Colossians 3 and 16. Go ahead and read that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's all I need then. 
He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you. I know this all I need because Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you. We're talking about the word of God. They are spirit and they are life. That's what's going to get you back on the road to getting eternal life. Get you back to your destiny. He said, the words, he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Richly in all what? In all wisdom. Uh-huh. Teaching and admonishing one another mm -hmm. in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, that lets you know right here from what we just read in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. We said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, that lets you know being filled with the Spirit is being filled with the Word of Christ. That's what's dwelling in you. See, people can't answer that question. You say, well, you filled with the Spirit. Where you feel over that? They start looking funny then because they know, wait a minute, what do you mean? What do you mean why I'm filled over that? It's all in me. Now, where you feel of, full of it at? Where are you full of the Spirit at? Where does it enter you at? It, it in your mind. That's where it in there. It dwells here because it's the Word. That's how important it is to get the true word of God. We're going to come back to Colossians in a second. We're going to go to uh, Romans 8 right quick. See, that's what's getting you back on track. Though we sin, Colossians, we're going to come back to Colossians 1, but right now Romans 8, Romans 8 and 11. Go ahead. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Now, what's, what's spirit? See, people talk spirit. They don't know what spirit they even talking about. Because spirit means different things in the Bible. I understand that. Sometimes it's the breath that's in your nostril. Sometimes it's the word that's in your mind. Sometimes it's referring to God who is a spirit. Sometimes it's referring to an angel who's a, who are all spirit being. All, see, the spirit, you can't just lump spirit together in one category. It means different things. In the Bible. That's why they get so confused. But I know the spirit we get filled of is this wisdom and knowledge. We get filled right here. Because this is what change. This control the whole body. Once you change your mind, you change everything. And this is what's going to get you back on track. Because once you get this, now you're on your back to your destiny to become God. That's why he said, if the spirit of, read it again, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Notice it got to dwell in you. It's dwelling right here, though. But if it's dwelling in you, what is going to do for you in the end? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. See, that's like the seed that's going to germinate into you getting eternal life. That's why I got to stay in you. That's why we got to meditate in it day and night. We got to stay in the work because it's easy to start drifting and you start thinking other things and doing other things. That's why you got to stay in it. That's why the Sabbath is so important. I learned that over the years. About 30 years now, I've been knowing I don't care what happened. I, didn't, I ain't going to lie. I didn't make some mistakes. Yeah, I hope you didn't think I hadn't. I didn't make some mistakes. But I learned a long time ago that, hey, you keep doing what you're supposed to do and the Lord going to make it okay. You keep striving. Like uh, years ago, I told this story before. It's a brother, brother named Stephen Dawson. This back in the 80s. I didn't go to class one Sabbath because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing Friday night. And I, and I still could have went. And it wasn't really, it was bad to me because something, I, you know, if you're having a conversation with somebody in the world, they say, you, you worry because you did that, that's all? That's because you were doing something on Friday? Yeah, because I understand what the Lord is saying. So they, that seemed crazy to them. But, yeah, I had messed up, and I still could have went the next day, and I felt bad, and I didn't go. And the next week, he saw me, and he, he said, man, well, I was looking for you last week because there wasn't that many people. He said, where you was at last week? He said, man, I messed up. You know, I messed up last Friday night. He said, yeah, I hear you, but Lord got to turn me away. Hey, I'm going to keep coming. That's why I know the Lord said, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. In Jeremiah 17, he said, Israel, you just keep the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is an anchor. See, you can't come here among us keeping the Sabbath week in and week out and stay filthy. You're going to either leave or you're going to change. You can't do it. That's, how, that's why the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. That's serious business right there. So that's how you, 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 you stay on point with it. So he said, look. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwell in you. Go ahead. 
Yeah, skip to 14, I'm sorry. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. See, we the sons of God now because we're being led by the Word. We his son now, but guess what? We still not really his son. See, that's a, that's a conundrum, whatever you call it. That, that, hey, we his son, but we not his son. What I mean by that, because we still haven't reached our full potential. That's what he said. For many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But now he going to say something else. Uh, what verse you at? 19. Skip to 19 and go ahead. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why are we waiting on something if we already the sons of God? Because it's two, two different kinds. We just being led by the spirit. We in his image now, and we got the spirit in us. But guess what? You can have the spirit in you now, and you still going to end up dying. You can be f as full of the spirit as you want to be, and we can, any of us can walk out there, get hit by a car, and be dead. Full of the spirit, but dead. But guess what? That's good if you're full of the spirit, because that's what's going to wake you up in the end. He's going to wake you up. But that show you you haven't reached your potential if that can happen to you, because that can't happen to God. So we the son, but we not the son, because we not what our father is. We haven't become what God is. Just like everybody that have a child in here, they child is what the parents are. They become man. You have a child, that's mankind. They what you are, in other words. So if you truly the child, the son of God, then you are God. But we haven't got there yet. We still waiting on it. So that's why he said, as many as led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Then turned around and said, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. We still waiting on in other words. Let's keep reading. Let's see the transformation. 22. Oh, 20. I'm sorry. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Uh-huh. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. See, that's all we got now. We subject to vanity. You know, death is vanity. Even going through stuff in this flesh is vanity. We subject to it now, but we got the hope to come out of this. 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage mm -hmm. of corruption mm -hmm. into the glorious liberty of the children of God. See, this is what we're trying to get out of. This body is corruptible. It's dying as we speak. But we're trying to get delivered out of this. Because, again, people have been talking about eternal life forever, but they don't know that you need a body to live forever. You need a certain type of body. This body ain't going to make it. So nobody never... Uh, Capitalize that you got to have another body. Go ahead. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh-huh. Go ahead. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. See, even though we got the first fruits of the Spirit, we can be full of the Spirit, but we still lacking. Go ahead. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, uh -huh. waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. Oh, see, because God ain't got to sleep with nobody for you to become God. No, that's why it's called an adoption. That's what you do. If you can't have produced children, you adopt them. Well, God don't get down like that. So we all being adopted. But we really trying to be in his family. We trying to be what he is. That's what the goal is. But how is it going to be fulfilled when we get that brand new body? That's why he said we waiting on the adoption. Even though we got the spirit, we full of it now. We waiting on the adoption to wit. What do you mean? The redemption of our body. This body got to be redeemed. Go ahead. Uh, skip to 20, 29. Mm -hmm. 29. Mm -hmm. For whom he did foreknow, mm -hmm. he also did predestinate mm -hmm. to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh -huh. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, we predestined. This is our destiny. That don't mean you could do what you want to do and say, well, I'm going to make it. God got me in and got me out. Yeah, if you act crazy, yeah, you was out. You ain't going to make it. See, some people take this the wrong way. Well, you know, it's, it's predestined, so whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. Yeah, you're going to determine what it's going to be. Your action is going to determine. But what it is, it's already a predestined route. God created man to be God. We got derailed. Now, if you get back on track and do what you need to do, you predestined to be God. But you got to stay the course. You got to stay to the end. He said he, he predestined, predestined what? To be conformed to the image of his son. 
Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. When was Jesus the firstborn among many brothers? Not till he resurrected. Not even in the beginning in Genesis or when he was born of Mary. No, when he resurrected because he died for mankind and then he came out to lead us out of death and became God. So he is the first to go through that. He started this creation off for us, really. He's the first of this type of creation, a man that died and became God. Let's look at it. Go to uh, back to Colossians 1. Back to Colossians 1. That's why he said he the firstborn. See, he was born into this. See, some people, you got people to call themselves witnesses. They, they try to put Jesus down. Oh, well, see, he wasn't, he was created in the beginning by Jehovah, Father Jehovah. And I, I tell them, I said, no, Jesus was Jehovah. They just really mess him up. I said, he was the one created. That ain't talking about he was created in the beginning. That's talking about the grave. Colossians 1, we're going to see it plainly. If you just read some more scripture, you'll see these things, but people get stuck in a vacuum. 1 and 12, go ahead. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us to meet, well, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So he done made us worthy for this thing. Go ahead. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness mm -hmm. and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's right. Go ahead. In whom we have redemption through his blood, mm -hmm. even the forgiveness of sin. That's what it took. Go ahead. Who is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God. See, we ain't never seen the Father, but he's the image. That's how I know what image we was made in. We was made in his image. Go ahead. The firstborn of every creature. But then they say the firstborn. I'm telling you, I had some Jehovah's Witnesses come here and they said, see, that's when the Father made Jesus. Jehovah made Jesus. He was the first of his creation. They tried to go to Proverbs 8, which is really talking about wisdom. They said, see, he was the first of his creation back then. See, but it was all Jehovah God. I'm like, look, Jesus. I showed one, because uh, they used to come to my house all the time. I showed one of them how uh, Jesus was I am. And I showed them, I showed them that no man had talked to the Father. Then I showed them how they went back there in, in Exodus 24 and 70 some people talked to him. Even his little student, because they always bring an elder. When they come back a few times, they're going to bring an elder with them, and he's supposed to set you straight. Even his students had their mouth open. And the man couldn't say nothing. I said, well, see, they didn't see. So no man had seen the Father. So who did they see back here in Exodus 24 where it said they saw God? The man only could say, well, see, uh, uh, uh. Saul didn't really mean Saul. His students said, what the? <laughs> Saul didn't mean Saul. He couldn't even get out of it in his Bible. It said the same thing. See, Saul didn't really mean they saw. No, that's what it just said. In the conversation, we can't talk no more when Saul don't mean Saul. <laughs> that's worse than Bill Clinton. Depends on what the definition of is, is. <laughs> but now. We at Colossians 1. What verse we at? He, uh, 16. We read 15. He said he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Go ahead, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, uh -huh. visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions uh -huh. or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. See, people just don't believe this. I mean, it's telling you he was the one did the creating back then. Talking about Jesus. Go ahead, 17. And he is before all things, uh -huh. and by him all things consist. See, it's simple. But they said, no, nah, he was created. That's when he was the firstborn. That's when that happened. Well, let's keep reading. We're going to see when he was the firstborn. Go ahead. And he is the head of the body, uh -huh. the church, uh -huh. who is the beginning, uh -huh. the firstborn from the dead. Oh, that's when he was the firstborn, period. And we're going to be the seconds when we come out. That's why it all hands on the resurrection. You can't die and go straight to heaven. He didn't do that, did he? He died and went to the grave for at least three days and three nights. So he had to stay a time. And then he came up. So he said he is the beginning. Notice it said he's, see, he's starting this thing off for. He's starting what off? He's starting this great grand creation off for God. What is the creation? God. Even though he was God already, 
This is when God was created all over again. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that what? That in all things he might have the preeminence. Uh, all things. See, he went through the ropes to get it. Revelation 3. Revelation 3. So now once you understand all that, he paved the way for us. Now we can fulfill our potential. Other than that, we was off track. We got derailed. Notice what it said here in Revelation 3. See, people don't catch stuff like this. It just told you he was the beginning. But the beginning of what? The beginning of man created by God to be God. 3 and 14. Go ahead. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, uh -huh. the faithful and true witness, uh -huh. the beginning of the creation of God. The what? The beginning of what? See, we think this creation is about the sun and the moon. And, oh, look at the heavens. No, this creation is about one thing. It's about the creation of God. He's, he's the beginning of that. That's what we just read in Colossians, right? See, that's how stuff go together. He's the beginning of the creation of God. He mean that because we didn't take a straight path by disobeying God. Now, let's go to uh, 1 John 3. Let's see, since he's beginning, when the little brother's going to come, because it said he might be the firstborn among many brothers. See, we ain't got it yet. We still hoping and striving for it. People act like they got something now. You ain't got nothing left. You still flesh and blood and going to die tomorrow. So you can't have it yet. We got the hope of having it. 1 John 3 and uh, verse 1. Go ahead. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. See, that's what it called us, provided we led by the Spirit. We the sons of God. But we know that's not it because he said the man... The, uh, we waiting on the manifestation. Our expectation of the Spirit waiting on the manifestation of the sons of God. So we are tight now, but we waiting on the real deal to come forth. So it's love that we call the sons of God, but what, what, what status you have in this world? Go ahead. Therefore, the world knoweth us not uh -huh. because it knew him not. See, you're not going to be liked in this world like Jesus wasn't. Go ahead. Beloved. Now are we the sons of God. Right now, spiritually, because we got the spirit in us. That's provided we got the spirit in us. We the sons of God now, but that's where the asterisk I like to say. Go ahead. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Oh, but it still don't appear what we're going to be. What is, what, what's going to happen and when? But we know that when he shall appear, uh -huh. we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Oh, when he come back, since he's the first, he's going to have some seconds. Since he's the beginning, he started it off for us. But it's going to be some more. That's going to be like him. We trying to become God. So that's going to take everything we got, brothers and sisters. This ain't some lightweight. Anything that you strive for in this world, it take a lot. You trying to get a master's degree. You trying to be a great athlete. Whatever you, it take a whole lot of effort. You going to tell me that you, you just going to stumble into being God? Uh-uh. You going to have to work. Hard for this, but you can do it. He said, when he shall appear, we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, people act like you're going to get all this great stuff. They really don't know what it is. And then you ain't got to do nothing to get it. That's two lies in one boat. They don't understand. Read verse 3. Let's see if you understand this, what it's going to be. Verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Oh, so if we hoping to become God, to become just like him, the big brother, then we're going to purify ourselves. And the next verse tells you you're going to start keeping the law because the law constitutes what's pure. Though we all sin and broke it, we don't continue to break it. That's what repenting is about. That's what Jesus came to give us another try. Let's go to uh, uh, Philippians 3. One more after this. Philippians 3. See, all this is in here for us to know. But if we not, if we get in one verse a week, notice, if you get one verse a week like you get at them churches, the average church, that's about all you get. Some of them get, I've seen them do a half, 
I'm gonna be nice and give him a whole verse. But I seen him do her. I, my text, my sermon is taken from half of the 52nd verse. And that's it. That's all they read. Bibles don't even put, by the time you get your Bible over to read, no. By the time you get it out, read over with. But I give them a whole verse. That means in a whole year, 52 Sundays, you done read 52 verses. We read more than that today, didn't we? But go ahead. Uh, first, uh, Philippians 3 and 20. Go ahead. For our conversation is in heaven. Mm -hmm. From whence also we look. For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh huh. What are you gonna do? Who shall change our vile body, uh -huh. that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body? See, to be God, you need a body like God. That's what we lacking right now. That's why this body we got now, you can't even kick your foot the wrong way. You be in trouble. You fell out. Oh, ain't God yet? You start thinking some of these brothers. Look, you got the potential to become God, but we not God. They walk around talking about God, God, yeah, but you still. Not quite there yet. But when we get this, he said, this is what Job understood in Job 19. He said, look, though worms destroy this body, I'm going to see him with my own eyes and my own flesh. See, this ain't nothing just relegated to one side of the Bible. The whole Bible telling us this stuff. He said, who shall change our vile body that it be fashioned like his glorious body according to what? According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. See, then you will met your purpose. You will fulfill the purpose of what God created you for. Then let's see how much power you got. First Corinthians 6. Because he said you're going to have dominion over everything. We're going to make sure you understand this is not no joke. He mean everything. First Corinthians 6 and, and 1. Go ahead. Dare any of you. Having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So that's telling us that being that we, we operating according to God's standards, it shouldn't be nothing we can't handle among ourselves. We should be able to deal with it. That's why sometimes, even in relationships, you know, you have people get upset and stuff go wrong. I even tell some people, look, you ain't even got to call, you know, I mean, of course, if it's something just out of hand, somebody just went crazy, you might need to call the police. But call some of the brothers first, if you can, to keep that. Because if everybody's supposed to be serving God, we should be able to reason. Now, if we get somebody we can't reason with, we know how to deal with it. But still, this is, especially if it's just some hurt feelings or even some property involved, this is what they was doing. They was getting mad, suing one another, which is totally unnecessary. He said, so I dare you to do that, to go before the, the justice system to solve some matters between saints. Verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Go ahead. And if the world shall be judged by you, uh -huh. are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So you should be able to handle these small matters. Go ahead. Know ye not we shall judge that we shall judge angels? So he said, don't you know we're going to do what? Judge angels? Who ever heard of such a thing? But that's what God do, right? See, we was created to be over the angels. We was made in the beginning a little lower than the angels, but our destiny is to be over the angels. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Go ahead. How much more things that pertain to this life? And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. 